I like fog. Just thought I'd share that. We used to run behind the DDT trucks. Oh my God. Afraid. <laughs> <laughs> that explains a lot, Dana. Because <laughs> we like fog. <laughs> Welcome to Damn It, Jim, the podcast. A fun and fascinating look at Star Trek, the original series. Hosted each week by Dan Calzretta and Dana Smith. Dan, last week we discussed the Doomsday Machine, and this is another one of those episodes that people really love. So as you might guess, uh, we got more than a few comments on our discussion about it. Yeah, we did. It'll be exciting to share some of these with the listeners. Pam McClung on Facebook said, I was surprised that when diapers came up last week, you both neglected to bring up Schmitter. Although I'm not a fan of the overused joke, I was totally expecting it. Couldn't believe you let an opportunity slip by, but you did bring him up later. Some things just are hard to die. Although some people would like to kill that Schmitter thing. Ryan Whiteside said, some of these episodes are so bad that I'm glad I have your podcast so I don't have to live through them again. Mike Conrad, I wonder if he's any relation to William Conrad or Bob Conrad. Well, we should ask him. I have a Wild Wild West connection here later. Mike Conrad said, no discussion at all on the drama of the Spock-Decker command sequences, but you found plenty of time to talk about diapers. Come on, please. Mike, we did discuss that, and we actually, actually had a clip Didn't spend a lot of time on it. Most of the conversations did devolve uh, (laughs) fairly quickly. So uh, I apologize for that. That was a key point in the show. We we did get into the ramble fast on that one. And then finally, uh, last comment that I have is Steve Hosa revealed an autographed picture of William Wyndham that uh, he got at a uh, show, looks like. And then he also shared a picture of William Wyndham holding up that same picture. So that was pretty cool to have gotten to meet him. So I'm very envious. Do you have any additional comments or email messages, Dan? From YouTube, we have a comment from Comrade Wireless Caller. He said, I hated the Apple, except for the ending, of course. It's always fun getting to see the Enterprise blast something from orbit. So thank you, Comrade Wireless Caller, for that. Anthony contacted us. He was also a little upset with the diaper references, or at least maybe with us making so many diaper references. He said, I was really looking forward to your review of one of the best episodes of the series. While I usually enjoy your tongue-in-cheek take on the show, this podcast should be flushed down the schmitter. A third of this week's episode was devoted to astronaut diaper discussion, giving short shift. I actually think he means short shrift, uh, to an excellent episode with one of the strongest performances by a guest star. I'm hoping next week's episode is back up to par, or I'll have to ask for your agonizer. (laughs) I kind of like the end of that uh, email from him. However, another listener said, your episode of the Doomsday Machine was so funny, I had tears streaming down my face. I was laughing so hard, I couldn't catch my breath. Yours is the most entertaining podcast I listen to. She must not listen to too many podcasts, is my guess. (laughs) Ran Man sent us a video showing how gravity would affect how fast objects would fall on different planets. I thought that was kind of cool. Of course, the more mass a planet has, the faster an object falls. That's something from science class, Dana, that you may have slept through. I'm not <laughs> sure. Uh, he ends the email with, in Schmitter we trust. <laughs> so that's oh, kind of wow. funny. All right. And finally, from a new listener, Gus, he recently found our show and has been listening to them in the order that we put them out. He says about where no man has gone before, I liked Dana's take on absolute power corrupts absolutely. He is very insightful and brings a lot to the show. You didn't pay him to say that, did you, Dana? Wow. Gus, thank you so much for being so wise. (laughs) He also said, I enjoy hearing about the behind the scenes. I can tell you to do your research. Well, at least one of us does. Actually, no, we both do. Another thing I like is how you two don't think Star Trek is perfect. You make good points critiquing the show. And thank you, Gus, for those comments. We appreciate all the comments that people send in. And we'd love to hear from all of you. So make sure to send us an email or get a hold of us through a comment on YouTube or Facebook. Tonight's episode, Cat's Paw. Yeah, I didn't know what that title meant. I had to look it up. Did you know what that meant? I remembered that there was a cat in it, and I thought it literally meant a cat's paw, and that they just ran the words together. Because there was a cat in the show? Yeah. And the cat had a paw? At least one. <laughs> I didn't know what it meant either. I had to look it up. Sometimes I don't even think about looking up the 
meaning of the titles of the episode, but this time I did. And cat's paw is defined as a person who is used by another to carry out an unpleasant or dangerous task. So I'm the cat's paw in this podcast? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> this is not a dangerous podcast. A little <laughs> unpleasant. Hmm. <laughs> Maybe we should go on. Anyway, I, th I found that I found that interesting, Dana. As I mentioned last week, you always learn something when you're listening to our podcast. That's right. And sometimes you learn things you don't want to know. Although I did think the astronaut diaper thing was things people wanted to know. Maybe not in that episode, but... <laughs> <laughs> it is the first question that every kid asks when they're talking about astronauts and space and that kind of thing. That's the first question they ask. We're going down the diaper hole again, Dana. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> so we start the show with Uhura trying to connect with the landing party of Sulu, Scotty, and Jackson on Pyrus 7. Jackson finally communicates and says, one to beam up. He sounds kind of wooden. Kirk asks, what about the others? And Jackson just says, one to beam up. Kirk and Spock and McCoy race to the transporter pad as Jackson beams aboard. And right after he materializes, he just falls over. He fell like a tree. Yeah, it, it was great. Yeah, he like bounced off the transporter pad and then down the steps and he didn't move. Yeah, I, I watched that a couple of times and I think it's the best stunt that we've seen so far in any episode of Star Trek. So this guy is Jimmy Jones, the actor who played Jackson. And it said he was an actor and a stuntman both. He's also the son of another stunt performer and the grandson of a former Buffalo Bills Wild West showman. Wow. Runs in the family, apparently. That's pretty wild. Yeah. A little funny story, actually. When he got the role, I guess he hadn't seen, really seen the series, wasn't really familiar with it. And he had to go over to a neighbor's house and ask this kid who lived there, what does the line mean, I'm ready to beam up, sir? He, he had no idea what it meant. <laughs> But they needed him for that fall specifically, so they hired him. Yeah, well, he did a great job. Great job, so, yeah. So McCoy checks for a pulse, and then he turns to Kirk and says, the man is dead. So then a voice comes out of Jackson as Kirk is kind of holding him, and uh, it's calling to Kirk, and it says, leave this place or you will all die. Yeah, it was weird because his mouth wasn't moving, right? No, no. Did you notice, though, in the left corner of his mouth, when it kind of zoomed in on his face, there was something there. It was like, I don't know, a wart or something right in the corner of the lip. I thought it was like the piece of gauze they used to put his teeth back in his head after he <laughs> fell. <so. laughs> I think you're probably right, because, man, that was a great fall. For our yeah. listeners who haven't seen this, go back and watch it. If nothing else, just that fall. It was really good. You've got to figure he practiced it a couple of times, you know, and so once, you know, hit the steps with his face, you know. <laughs> yeah, the reason he didn't have any other lines, he couldn't talk. They had to wire his mouth <laughs> shut because of the broken jaw. Yeah, not easy being on Star Trek. Guy got blown up a couple of weeks ago. Yeah, That's right, yeah. So Kirk leaves DeSalle in charge of the Enterprise and beams down to the planet to investigate. Spock and McCoy accompany him. They can't explain why there's a fog that is very present on the planet. Everything looks very dark and dreary. Do you remember growing up on WGN in Chicago, they would play Creature Features on Saturday night? Oh, yeah. So in one of the opening scenes of Creature Features, which were all like horror movies, they would show a scene from The Wolfman. Yeah, where he's walking across the marsh. Yeah, that's what this reminded me of with that fog. You know, it's kind of cool. All those like old uh, 40s movies, especially the ones set in Europe, always had fog on the ground. Yeah. Very cool. I like fog. Just thought I'd share that. <laughs> We used to run behind the DDT trucks. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> that explains a lot, Dana. Because <laughs> we like fog. <laughs> Let's see, the, the hair loss, the not knowing what a difference between a star and a galaxy. Uh, it could be a lot of things. <laughs> I'm sure there's no problem with that. Yeah, as, as birds were falling out of the trees around us, we were chasing the, the DDT truck down the, down the road. <laughs> now, for people who don't know, I mean, some of our listeners might know, but we grew up in the Midwest. There was a mosquito problem, and these trucks would come around starting in early summer, late spring, something like that, and they'd be fogging the neighborhoods, man. They'd be, the yellow light would be flashing. It'd be at night. It's say, kids, get in the house. Don't breathe that. Oh, nobody ever said that to us. <laughs> <laughs> 
maybe you got that in your neighborhood. <laughs> we didn't get that in ours. It was kids, come out and play. And then the ice cream truck would follow right behind. Yeah. <laughs> Oh man, <laughs> do they still use? No, they they stopped it. They stopped it when we were kids. Uh huh. When after the birds fell out of the trees and the kids started dropping, <laughs> they, they, they thought, uh, "Huh, maybe there's something wrong with this." Yeah. <laughs> oh my God, you really went and chased those trucks, huh? That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> If there's any doctors, neurologists in the audience, maybe uh, <laughs> if you need a study on... The long-term effects of DDT. Yeah, yeah. exactly. But uh, I, I do have a question for you, though, Dana. Do mosquitoes ever come by you anymore? No, they just kind of drop when they go within two or three feet of me. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been bit by a mosquito since I was like seven. <laughs> <laughs> Spock reports life form readings, and they call up the Enterprise, and Chekhov is there... Oh my God, he's got a bad wig on. <laughs> well, this was actually the first one filmed, wasn't it? Yeah, it's like they put a helmet on his head and then tried to put hair over it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I thought there was a small dog on his head at first. <laughs> I could have been a medium-sized dog, yeah. So. <laughs> You're right, though. It was bad. I was just shocked. Uh, yeah. So. Chekhov says he's only seen the landing party of Kirk, Spock, and McCoy. Next thing, they hear these ghostly voices, and they look up through the fog, and they see these three kind of ghoulish witches. It's like straight out of Macbeth. <laughs> And then says, remember the curse, wind shall rise and the fog descend. So leave here all or meet your end. That was a bad attempt at Shakespeare, whoever wrote those lines, <laughs> yeah. you know, so bad. The funny thing, though, you you acted right in high school and you did some other acting. I did act it in college and yeah. act every day at work. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever do Macbeth? Oh hell no! Yeah, yeah. doing Shakespeare, you—I mean, that's that's like a man. That that's like a lot of work. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you know that bug spray didn't allow you to memorize. <laughs> yeah. Well, there there is a superstition in the theater world about Macbeth. Do you know about this? You only refer to it as the play. You don't call it by name. Yeah, or the Scottish play, right? Yeah, and the, the superstition is if you say that word in the theater, you're going to be cursed. And it goes back apparently even to one of the first performances of Macbeth in the early 1600s. But there is a way to get rid of it. If you're in a theater and you say Macbeth, it's bad. I mean, it is no joke. You've got to exit the theater, spin around three times, spit, curse, then knock on the theater door to be allowed back in. Are you serious? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I've never heard that before. Yeah. There is a way to get rid of the curse, but you have to do those things. Now, it doesn't say which way to spin. I mean, which way would, do you think they should spin? I would think counterclockwise. I would think so, too, to kind of undo what you just did. Of course. Yeah. That's why you undo any curse. Yeah. <laughs> Did you do that after following the mosquito truck? Or? <laughs> no, because no curse would follow me after that. <laughs> it's kind of funny because uh, Kirk asked Spock. Spock, comment. Very bad poetry, Captain. A more useful comment, Mr. Spock. That was a great line. Kirk just kind of like rolls his eyes and like, you know, doesn't even laugh. Then Spock says, what we saw was not real. Then Kirk responds, that's very helpful. Like, <laughs> the stupidest remark. Like, why is that even helpful? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so then the wind all of a sudden kicks up and gusts and blows the men backwards. Yeah, in fact, I was afraid Shatner was going to lose his wig. I was hoping. I was... <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's ever seen him without it, so. Maybe it was a stunt wig. They must have stapled that thing on or something, but. Ouch. So then the wind kind of dies down. They start forward again and they get around one of the rocks and McCoy turns and sees a castle. And it looks real spooky kind of thing, like. Maybe Dracula lives there or something. Yeah, this thing has a very like spooky vibe to it, doesn't it? The whole thing so far. Oh, yeah. And Spock says the life forms are registering inside that castle. Inside the castle, they are greeted by an angry black cat. Kirk says, If we weren't missing two officers and a third one dead, I'd say someone was playing an elaborate trick or treat on us. Trick or treat, Captain? Yes, Mr. Spock. You'd be a natural. I'll explain it to you one day. 
So is that like a smack in the face? Yeah, you'd be a natural. Oh, yeah, because of the way he looks. Yeah. So they move deeper inside the castle and the door closes behind them. And then suddenly the floor gives way and the three of them are dropped down into a, what looks like a medieval torture chamber. So when they wake up, they're chained to the wall. Spock kind of pulls on the chain and says, everything is real. And Kirk says, it's like a human nightmare. And Spock says, it's as if someone knew what terrifies man most on an instinctive level. And Kirk says, ghost stories. Yeah, I don't know about that. (laughs) I thought the same thing. I was kind of like, really? Ghost stories? Mm -hmm. That's what terrifies man? What would it have been for you? Like, if it was you and they looked deep into your mind, but what would be like the terrifying thing for you in that situation? Spiders. Spiders. Yeah. Like huge, huge spiders. Oh, yeah. Have you ever seen, what are they called? Clock spiders in Australia? Oh, my God. I I nearly faint looking at the pictures. I know. They're freaking (laughs) huge, man. They are huge. If I came home, one of those things was on the side of my house, I'd I'd just sell the house and move. (laughs) Or maybe just not even sell it. Just leave. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Where's Dana? No idea. (laughs) (laughs) One time I saw a video of a spider that was so big, it ate a possum. It like got the possum. I'm not joking. I'm not joking. And I'm not looking that up because if it's true, I do not want to see it. (laughs) Well, if I can find it, I'll put the link in the show notes so people can watch that because it was crazy. Yeah, spiders. That's that's big deal. Yeah. So just then uh, Sulu and Scotty come in and Scotty's holding a phaser and they both look like kind of like zombies. They've got blank expressions on their face. Yeah. And Kirk says, put down the phaser, but they don't respond. McCoy says they appear to be drugged. Sulu holds up a key and unlocks McCoy's chains, then Kirk and then Spock's. And then they kind of like usher them out of the room. And as they're going towards the steps, Kirk and Spock turn around to disarm them. And all of a sudden, they're in another room, and you hear this guy go, stop. There's a bald guy sitting on a big cushy chair. His robes are like something a sorcerer would wear. Yes, yeah, wizard-like. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and Kirk kind of like just walks away from everybody and looks around the room, then comes back and says, what have you done with my men? By the way, the robe that guy was wearing, I thought was really cool. I'd like to have one of those robes. You know that Gilligan wore it in an episode of Gilligan's Island. That same robe? That same robe. So this bald, wizard-looking dude uh, asks, where did your race get this ridiculous predilection for resistance? You examine and question everything. Did you notice that the black cat was sitting right next to him on the chair? Yeah. Yeah, I have a question about that cat, Dana. So I think dogs are probably pretty easy to train, but to train a cat, I mean, doesn't that seem hard to do? Yeah. I've had six cats in my life, and I'm... Never was successful at training any of them. So this guy says his name is Karab. He says, uh, we did not bring you here. You insisted on coming. And Kirk asks, why all the mumbo jumbo? And Spock says, mapping expeditions have never found life signs on this planet before. And Karab says, it is of no importance that we are not native to this planet. And then the cat cries and Karab kind of listening to the cat says, oh, I've been a bad host. So Spock comments, there are ancient earth legends about wizards and their familiars. Familiars? Demons in animal form sent by Satan to serve the wizard. Superstition. I do not create the legend, Captain. I merely report it. Now, how does he know about that, but doesn't know about Halloween? How's that possible? Yeah, if you know that much detail about demons and serving Satan for the wizard, you don't know about Halloween? Yeah. All Hallow's Eve? Right. The cat cries and then runs out of the room. A moment later, Sylvia enters the room in a flowing gown, and she's got some pretty big hair. And a huge forehead. And a wig as well. Yeah, that's (laughs) got to be a wig. My God. Yeah. What is a wig maker called? Or like the person in charge of wig? Are they a wigster? What, What are they called? And then the term to wig out. How does that relate to wigs? Well, they also said things like flip your wig. Yeah. Back in the 60s. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Were wigs just falling off (laughs) willy-nilly? I don't think they're the same quality as they are today. Well, is it the quality of the wig or is it the quality of the adhesive? I would guess the adhesive is improved. I mean, do they have to be stuck on with something? Do you know? I would think that it's like, you know, what they call it, that spirit gum or something that they use to like put mustaches on people and stuff. Oh, super glue. (laughs) So, yeah, now Sylvia's in the room and like I said, big hair 
and she's wearing the same amulet that the cat was wearing. Oh, that's right. I totally didn't remember that until you just said it. So the implication is she's the cat. Yeah. I mean, I got that part, you know, from watching the show, but I, I don't remember the amulet. That's a good, good catch on your part. And they also did her makeup around her eyes, kind of make her more look like a cat. And she poops in a litter box. <laughs> I'm cutting out all poop jokes, by the way. There's going to be no poop jokes in this episode. <laughs> so Sylvia jumps right into the conversation and says, it's a simple matter of probing your minds. Spock looks at Kirk and says, telepathy. She says, not entirely. Telepathy doesn't mean control. And I guarantee you, I have full control. Yeah, this whole conversation, Dana, it didn't really make much sense. What is the purpose? These two yeah. people or aliens, what is the goal here? Yeah, I, I was struggling with this. And I think the writer was too. <laughs> I think you're right. I think you're exactly right. Yeah. So Sylvia pulls out a small figure of the Enterprise on a chain. She says she created an image of Jackson in her head. And when she killed that image, he died. Kirk says, you can't think a man to death. No, but you can talk one to death, apparently, because she was trying. <laughs> Kirk says, I'm the only one that can talk anything to death around here. So. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> so she makes the communicator appear and she tells him to call signal the ship. And then she holds the figure of the Enterprise over the candle on the table. And Kirk calls up the Enterprise and DeSalle reports that the temperature is rising over 60 degrees in the last 30 seconds. And they are just sweating on the Enterprise, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Chekhov was probably sweating from that freaking thing he had on his head anyway. So. <laughs> exactly right. So Kirk closes the communicator or gets ready to close the communicator and says he'll handle it down here. And then he takes the figure of the ship away from Sylvia. And he says, OK, you won. On the ship, Chekhov reports that the temperature is dropping back to normal. <laughs> OK, hold on a second. <laughs> that sounded like a cross between Chekhov and Scotty. <laughs> I practiced Scotty all all week. Okay. And were you disappointed in this episode, Dana? Yeah, because he doesn't speak. He's got one line at the end. <laughs> <laughs> hey, what if we were able to get a voice coach to join the show as a guest to try to get us to do a good Scottish accent? I like it. On the planet, Kurab says, you've seen some of our science. Now tell us about yours. He then moves the scepter over the model of the Enterprise, and suddenly it's encased in like glass or a resin or something. Kurab says, it's an impenetrable force field around your ship. It will not hinder the orbit, but your people are prisoners within. You know, I saw that prop years ago at the Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. Well, they don't have it anymore. It's actually now at the New Mexico Air and Space Museum. Wow. They also have an original Tribble in New Mexico as well. On the ship, Chekhov says they are trapped, a force field that is all around us. Back on the planet, Sylvia says, I would advise you to cooperate. The information we want to extract from you is not complicated, but it is extremely painful. What information, Dana? What did they <laughs> want to know? On the Enterprise, DeSalle asks for wavelength analysis, and Chekhov says it will not analyze. Now, I found this interesting because he's talking about wavelengths. Yeah. Light is measured in wavelengths. So what's your point? I don't understand what's your point. <laughs> it's like this show. What's the point? <laughs> you mean our show or this episode? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, probably both, really, if we're honest with ourselves, Dana. But maybe we're just not on the same wavelength. I don't know. So back in the dungeon, Kirk and Spock are chained up. I mean, again, they're chained up down there. Yeah. Yeah. This is the second time. Yeah. Spock says, to an Earthman like yourself, this must seem quite familiar. Kirk says, yes. Ghosts, witches, black cats. Spock says, they all belong to the twilight world of the consciousness. Kirk says, they tried to tap our conscious mind, but they missed. What? That's again, once again, Dana, what the heck does that mean? <laughs> and Kirk says, they referred to us as creatures. If we're creatures, I wonder what they are really like. And Spock says something totally alien. No shit. <laughs> yeah. Again, this is one of those, you know, oh, really? Thanks. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Great, great analysis there. Really, this whole episode, I think, suffers from, and, and this one scene is emblematic of the whole thing. There's a lot of talking, but it doesn't really make much sense. So McCoy comes in and he's with Scotty and Sulu. And you can see that McCoy has been put under a spell as well. They unlock Kirk and take him out of the dungeon. Kirk is escorted 
escorted into the room. Sylvia dismisses Karab. Kirk's kind of like uh, looking around. It's like, well, what now? And uh, wave your magic wand and destroy my mind too. Kirk says, a woman should have compassion. I forget, you're not a woman. She says, I am a woman now. I come from a world without sensations, but you and I now know it excites me. And I want more. So this dialogue is stimulating, <laughs> but it's at the same time, it's degrading to women. Totally. Okay. I get she's an alien. So maybe it's not really from the woman's point of view. It's an alien point of view, but it's a woman saying it. And it just sounds like I'm a woman and I, I, I'm here for sensations. I've, I'm very limited in my worldview. Dana, we've talked about this many, many times. The way that women are portrayed in the show and the kind of dialogue that they're given. In. And I think you're absolutely right. It's degrading. So Kirk starts putting the moves on her. Sylvia looks at him kind of lustfully and says, no, not that. Not for you. Join me. My mind to yours. Kirk keeps trying to romance her. He's touching her hair and getting closer to her. And she says, you excite me. Why? And Kirk says, for the same reason you excite me. Again, this whole thing makes no sense from beginning to end. Why are they on the planet? What do they need to know about humans? Why is she so interested in in Kirk. None of this makes any sense to me, Dana. Yeah, well, I, I'm glad. I was concerned that I was, you know, really falling off here. And then Kirk starts asking her questions about her powers. And then she realizes all of a sudden that he is trying to use her to get information from her. And she yells at him. You are using me. You holding your arms and there is no fire in your mind. You're trying to deceive me. Like words on a page. You are using me. Kirk says, and why not? You've been using me and my crew. She says, you'll be swept away. You and your crew, your ship, your world. Scotty and Sulu and McCoy take him away. If only the episode had ended there. Oh, gosh. It really would have been good if it ended there. Yeah. Because it wouldn't have made any less sense if it ended there. <laughs> Just then, in the dungeon, Kurab comes and frees Kirk and Spock. And he says, I have released the model of your ship from the crystal. Kurab gives Kirk the phaser and the communicator and says, you must leave now. They see a shadow of a big cat on the wall. And it's, I mean, it looks as big as them. Kurab says, I think I can stop her. We see the cat coming down the hallway. Its body, like, fills the hallway. And uh, so, you know, it had to be a model that they used for that. So they return to the dungeon and Spock looks up at the hole they fell through. Now, I mentioned before about Robert Conrad that while there's a connection here with Wild Wild West. I swear this set was used in Wild Wild West at least a half dozen times. Really? I don't know if you remember in Wild Wild West, if they fell through a hole and they couldn't get back up through it, he'd pull out the little plastic explosives that he kept in his heel, put it, set it underneath a bucket, and then light it so he could blow himself up to the next level <laughs> <laughs> without sending his legs in multiple directions. <laughs> And wait, was he sitting on the bucket or standing on it? Because if you're sitting on that bucket, <laughs> that's going to be bad news, man. Oh, the vibration. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so actually, they don't uh, find a bucket to like, you know, explode themselves up into the next level. Kirk hoists Spock up as uh, Kurub goes back to the dungeon door and the big cat hisses and growls. And we see the cat like looking through the little bars on the door. This cat, right? They're getting it to howl and scream. How do you think they got that cat to do that? Do you think back then they had this organization that would prevent cruelty to animals in television and film? No. So you think they were like sticking it with a red hot poker or something to get it to do that? <laughs> I mean, what, what was going on? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, maybe pulling its tail or something. That cat was pissed though. I mean, there was no fooling around. So the big cat hisses and growls and the, the whole like building chicks. And then Kurob's against the door and she knocks the door. She hits the cat, hits the door and it knocks the door down on Kurob. That was a stupid <laughs> scene. <laughs> I just thought that was dumb. Yeah, because he it's almost like he pulled the door down on top of him. And Kirk tries to help Kurob, but he can't lift the door. Kirk grabs Kurob's scepter and then he tosses it up to Spock, who's up on the next level. So since there's no way to hoist Kirk up, he uses the bed that was there that we never saw before. It's got some good springs and he's able to uh, jump up and down on the springs and Spock pulls him up. This whole episode, stuff like that <laughs> just was driving me crazy. That didn't really make any sense. Like, why was that there? Why do you put a bed in a torture chamber? After we torture you, we want you to be comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, the person doing the torturing, they need a break. You know, they need to take a nap. So tired. My, my whipping arm is killing me. <laughs> <laughs> 
just as Kirk clears the top of the hole, McCoy comes up and tries to brain him with a mace or something. And Kirk kicks him. And then we have a bad McCoy stunt double fighting Kirk. I look more like McCoy with my shaved head than this guy looked like. So then Scotty comes up and starts trying to hit Spock. Finally cut back to Kirk as he knocks out McCoy. And then Sulu comes around striking a Kung Fu pose. And then we see Kirk throw Sulu, another bad stunt stunt double. Yeah, who, who looked like he weighed 50 to 80 pounds more than George Takei. And a good 20, 30 years older than him, too. <laughs> exactly <So>. right, yeah. <laughs> when uh, Kirk throws him, Sulu hits the door and he's knocked unconscious. We see and hear the cat return. So we see the shadow of the cat backing away and then Kirk kind of looks around and he turns back and Sylvia is there. She says, you're very clever, very resourceful, handsome. What the hell, Dan? <laughs> 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 so Sylvia kind of stops and then she makes this move where she kind of runs her fingers down her neck to the amulet and then her and Kirk disappear. So Kirk realizes that they've changed locations and he says, don't you tire of playing games? And she says, I don't play games. She says, give me the transmuter. Kirk holds out the transmuter like he's going to give it to her. And then all of a sudden he smashes it on the table and there's a white flash and suddenly Kirk is standing outside on the planet. So like the whole castle's gone and everything. They're just outside now. Yeah. So Spock, McCoy, Scotty and Sulu all come up. Scotty says, everything's vanished. Yeah, that was pretty good. I would say that's pretty good. Was that his only line in this episode? His only line in the episode. Kirk points down on the ground and says, not everything. There's two really odd looking creatures like mutant chickens with crab claws. They're all blue and kind of fluffy looking and they're making these weird noises. And then they kind of collapse. And Kirk says, Korob and Sylvia in their natural form. And Spock says, fascinating. If we could study them. And McCoy says, it's too late. And steps on them and crushes them. (laughs) (laughs) That would have been awesome. (laughs) That would have made this episode my favorite episode of all time if that would have happened. (laughs) And then McCoy says, all this is just an illusion. And Kirk says, it's no illusion. Jackson is dead. And he calls up the Enterprise 5 to beam up. And the alien forms of Kurab and Sylvia kind of fall over and smolder on the ground. But that's how the show ends, Dan. It is done, finally. So Dana, you have a few things you want to share with us about this episode. Yeah, this was written by Robert Block. He's also the one that wrote What Are Little Girls Made Of? And this was loosely based on one of his own short stories called Broomstick Ride. So while this was the first episode filmed for season two, it was released as the seventh episode just in time for Halloween and is the only episode that was considered a quote unquote holiday special. Yes, it's kind of related and they mention Halloween, but it's not like they were so celebrating it in the show or anything. It was released just three days before Halloween. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of cool, though, that they did that. Theo Marcus, who played Cora, died in a car accident just one month after this episode aired. Ooh, so the curse thing is real. So, Dan, do you want to discuss themes and dilemmas for this week's episode? Yeah, so the show sucked, Dana. I thought the episode was horrible, for the most part. A couple of interesting things, but but some of the themes behind it I find really fascinating, and I've thought about this, and we, we talked a little bit about it earlier, about, like, what scares people. Some of these things are really common across cultures, like the fear of night, the fear of the dark, right, all that kind of stuff. So I was researching that a little bit, and do you remember the Bloody Mary? Oh, yeah, you you go into a room with a mirror yeah, and you turn off the lights and you stand in front of the mirror and you say, Bloody Mary, Bloody Mary, like uh, I, you're supposed to say it like three times or yes. 10 times or something. Like three, that. yeah. Bloody Mary is supposed to appear. Yeah. And like as a kid, that would scare the crap out of you, right? Yeah. So in Japan, it's a similar kind of story. You go into a girl's bathroom, has to be on the third floor of a building. You have to walk to the third stall. You have to knock three times and call this girl's name. And when you open the stall, a little girl in a red skirt drags you into hell. Wow. It's interesting to me how every culture has some kind of weird, scary stories. It doesn't matter the culture, the time in history. It's like this is almost built into human nature, this idea of scary stories and and wanting to, to experience that for some reason. What about you, a dilemma for this episode? Once again, I think there's something in here about what does it mean to be human? Sylvia gets all worked up about having these sensations and stuff and wind 
to explore it more and learn. And it was overwhelming to her. Hey, Dan, I also wanted to point out, it's not a theme or dilemma, but I like the show a little bit better than you did. There's some fun to it. There's still some drama. But most importantly, they the actors in it keep up with what's going on. They take it all seriously. There's never a moment where they kind of do like the Batman thing in you know, the original Batman series with Adam West and kind of give us like the wink, wink, nudge, nudge, you know, aren't we being cute and fun? They don't play it as comedy at all. They play it as a drama and they keep it real by reminding us that the stakes are high because a crewman's died. Yeah, I wouldn't say I hated this. It's nowhere close to the alternative factor. N- not even close. It's just, I thought some stuff in it was stupid. Dana, what were some of your best parts of this episode? You mentioned the aliens in their true form. I know in the original episode, you could actually see that they were like marionettes and you could see the strings, but I liked them. I like something that's not humanoid. For something to be odd looking, completely different from what we'd expect, that's fascinating to me. How about you, Dan? You got a best? Yeah, I want to talk about the marionettes that they used too, because I saw the original and yeah, you can see the strings, no question about it. But the way that they made those at life forms is that they had like blue fluffy stuff and they had some pipe cleaners, but they also used some crab pincers. I did think they looked cool, but the strings totally like distracted <laughs> from it. There was no question you could see those strings. How about another good part for you? Uh, Jackson falling off the transporter pad. It was like a tree being cut off at its roots and just to- toppling over. Uh, I was really impressed by that fall. Yeah, I, absolutely. That was one of my best too. I'm totally impressed as well. Do you have a worst part for us, Dan? The endless talking in several parts of this episode, but especially Sylvia. Maybe she was getting paid by the word. I don't know. But it was just boring, just the stuff she said, and it didn't make any sense to me. She, I believe, is still alive, isn't she? Yeah, maybe we can get her on the show. Do you have another worst part, Dana? Sylvia kind of succumbing to uh, Kirk's manly seduction. Here she had all this power, and yet she just kind of starts folding you know, under Kirk. <laughs> So Dana, what do you have for us for this day in history? Dan, this was released on October 27th, 1967. In the U.S., the number one song was To Sir With Love by Lulu. That's two weeks in a row. And in U.K., the number one song was Massachusetts by the Bee Gees. Hey, also on this day, Father Philip Berrigan, a Roman Catholic priest of Baltimore, broke into the city's selective service office and poured blood into 16 file drawers as a protest against the Vietnam War. Also on this date, U.S. Air Force Colonel John P. Flynn was taken prisoner when his F-105 Thunder Chief fighter was struck by a surface-to-air missile while he was flying over North Vietnam. Flynn became the highest-ranking American prisoner of war of the Vietnam War. During his time as a POW, he would be promoted to the rank of Brigadier General. The day before, so on uh, October 26, Lieutenant Commander John McCain was shot down on his 23rd bombing mission. Also on this date, Scott Wheeland, American rock musician for the Stone Temple Pilots, was born in San Jose, California. Let's move on to the counts. So, Dana, how about the dead crewman count? Well, our uh, tree falling Jackson is the only crewman that I saw die. We got one, so a total of 36. The shirtless Kirk rip shirt Kirk count. None. I really thought we'd have more by now. I thought so, too. So zero for this week. We were stuck at 10. The he's dead count. I counted one. He didn't say he's dead Jim, but he said... The man is dead. The man is dead, yeah. So you think you think so? Yeah. I do, too. I just want to <laughs> kind of torture you a little bit with that question. Yeah, I do, too. I think it counts. I mean, he does say he's dead. Yeah. Okay, so we got one for a tally of seven. I'm a doctor, not a fill in the blank. Nope, nothing this week. So we got zero for a total of six. How about the supreme being count? I originally put zero, but I was reading an article. The person referred to Korob and Sylvia as supreme beings and said that they were able to control the ship. They were able to change things and make everything appear different, convince Kirk and everybody that they were in a completely different world and control Scotty and Sulu and McCoy. So what do you think, Dan? Well, I originally put zero, but now that you mention it, I mean, they could change matter, even though it was through a device. I guess the question is, does it matter that they needed a tool to do that? Does that matter to you? We counted Trelane and he needed the mirror. But if we compare them to Apollo, 
for example, they're not really any different because he needed the temple, which was a source of his power. So I think we should count them. I think you're right. Okay. Yeah, you good with that? Yep. All right. So this week, one for a total of eight. How about violation of the prime directive? They didn't violate the prime directive, but once again, they failed to communicate and get along with another species or another alien life form. Right. And ended up destroying it. Yeah, I don't think it was a violation of the prime directive either. I mean, it was a violation of good writing. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but not a violation of prime directive. So zero this week. We've got a total of five. Dana, what do we have coming up for next week? Next week's another fan favorite. I know it's one of yours. I mud. Yeah, I'm excited. I love that episode. All right. Well, have a great rest of your week, Dana. This was a lot of fun. Did you notice we didn't mention diapers once? I didn't, but uh, mine are starting to chafe, so I got to go. But, uh... <laughs> All right, Dan, enjoy the rest of your week. Hey, thanks again, Dan, and thanks to all our listeners. And thank you so much for your comments. Until we meet again, live long and prosper. Thanks once again for listening to Damn It Jim, the podcast. We'd love to hear from you. Please send us an email at dammitjimpodcast at gmail.com or join the discussion on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube. Make sure to join Dan and Dana next week for I Mud. Enjoy the rest of your week. And remember to live long and prosper. Mm-hmm.